This is the story of Monty Python's life of Brian. By what name are you calling him? Oh, Brian! We worship you, O Brian. Our film will chart the birth of the project. The idea of actually doing something based on the gospel story, I remember thinking at the time, well, this could provoke an awful lot of reaction. How it struggled to find backers for such a controversial film, and how, on its release in 1979, it delighted many and upset some others, but went on to become probably the world's best-loved and only biblical comedy. And this is the story of how Brian came to pass. In the year of our Lord, 1976, the Pythons were flushed with success. Their TV show had made them cult stars in the UK and US, and the release of their first feature, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, had propelled them to even greater international success. Our story begins in Amsterdam, where the Pythons were publicizing the Holy Grail and generally drinking heavily. Uh, we've been doing our, our publicity for Grail. It sort of brought us back together again. And I think we must have felt, well, the Grail's going down well. Maybe we should do another movie. The moment was really in, in, in Amsterdam, uh, one of our uh, drunken pub crawl one evening, and, and that was Eric when he said, you know, wouldn't it be great, let's do Jesus Christ Lust for Glory. And you know, I fell off the chair because that was so outrageous and wonderful and spot on. When we got back to London, uh, people started to take the idea of looking at this period, at this sort of mythic, you know, because the great thing about the Grail is it's a myth that we understand and therefore you can play with it in the mock heroic way. But here was a whole area and a subject which nobody had ever done for comedy. And that was very appealing because you go, well, why not? My reaction to the idea of doing a Bible story was slightly disappointing because... Um, uh, I always thought the costumes were so boring. <laughs> I remember going to a Church of England school, and every time we had to do a paint a biblical scene, you know, you thought, oh, it's everybody just in long robes, it's not very interesting. Born in the 1940s, all of the Pythons had received some form of religious education, but Christianity was either rejected or distrusted by each. I was at boarding school for 12 years, so we were uh, forced to go to church twice on Sundays. You know, the usual Church of England upbringing, you know, him singing and beating. There was a lot of religion thrown at us, but very little that was explained, certainly satisfactorily. And by the time I finished at uh, Clifton, I'd been confirmed, and I'd sat around for some weeks expecting some golden glow to descend on me. And when it didn't, I became fairly uh, atheistic or humanistic. I was, uh, in many ways, a little zealot. I had read the Bible at least twice by the time I was about 16. Uh, so I knew my stuff. I can do Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuels. I can do all those things. We used to have this old padre who was 76 and had been in the First World War and was rather good and taught us bad Latin. And I remember one of the boys asking him whether he believed in all this and, and whether it was true. And he said, well, old Bean, not really. And that was some from the Padre, so he went, OK, got it, OK, thank you, move on. I decided I'd had enough. It came about because I was always telling jokes. I mean, I, that's what I do. I make fun of things, I laugh at things, I find humour in things. And a lot of the people in the church found this offensive, I think is the word that they would use now. They probably didn't use that then. Um, and I got really angry. I said, what kind of God is this that you believe in that can't take a joke? especially my puny, pathetic little jokes. So I, I sort of walked away from religion around that time and thought, education is better. We were lucky because we shared the same attitudes to what religion wasn't. I don't think you could have ever got the Pythons to agree on what it was, but certainly we agreed on what it wasn't, and that was lucky. Before the Pythons could begin work on their biblical project, they decided to research their subject thoroughly. When we started off to write it, we said, well, what we're going to do is we're going to read everything about it. So we all did a, like a three-week Cambridge research period. I remember going with Terry and the others to see screenings of, of other um, biblical epics like Quo Vadis and Solomon and Sheba and all that. They were pretty dreadful. We realised that after about watching three or four of them, we suddenly realised they all had one thing in common. And that's what, that was that 
everybody in the film spoke in this very special way because they were aware that they were talk living at a time when something very wonderful was happening, you know. And I, I, mean, I remember saying to the others that, you know, people will find our film shocking because it'll be the first biblical film in which people speak in normal voices. Y tus trailers, visita mi canal. Quiet, Mom. Well, I can't hear a thing. Biblical epics viewed and the Gospels reread led all to realize that concentrating on Jesus was not the answer. You know, you've got Christ saying very good things and saying the right things and um, as a wonderful figure. So that's not where the, the fun lies, really. And that's why we actually didn't take the piss out of Jesus. We left him alone because uh, what's the point of it? I mean, what he said was rather good. What his followers then uh, got, got up to is something quite different. And the comedy, it seemed pretty clear, was in the interpretation of the, of the gospel and the fact that you have Christ preaching uh, a gospel of peace and love and charity to all and then for the next 2,000 years uh, people are killing each other and torturing each other because they can't agree about, about quite how he said it or how you interpret this. And throughout the land shall be a great rubbing of pots. And the angle that we, we all agreed on in the end was that you'd look at the historical situation in Judea at that time. Very interesting things going on, including this Messiah fever. It was a time when the sort of millennium was being sort of thought about again and people were, were expecting God to come down and clean up the world and all that. So people were looking for messiahs. And so the idea of someone being chosen uh, as the messiah when all, all he is is somebody happens to be around at the same time in the same place, seemed to unlock um, a way of doing this. No! Once you start thinking about it, it, it it's kind of, and start just thinking of it in everyday terms, you see, you accept that this happened. But when Mary said to Joseph, you, I'm pregnant, but it's okay, I wasn't with anyone because the Holy Spirit comes down, you know, and then Joseph goes off to the pub and says to his friend, you know, I was a bit worried that my wife was here. It's all all right because she, she, she was impregnated by the Holy Ghost and all his friends say, oh, fine. Well, that's a relief. You see what I mean? The moment you start looking at this stuff, <laughs> there's a funny side to it. As the Pythons set out to write their lampoon of the blindly faithful, events elsewhere took an ominous turn, when for the first time in 55 years, a prosecution was brought for blasphemy. Gay News published a poem by a, a minor poet called James Kirkup called The Love That Dares to Speak Its Name. It's a kind of meditation by a centurion at the crucifixion of Christ, and he meditates on the wounds of Christ and he rather gets off on these wounds and Mrs Mary Whitehouse took objection to this particular poem and therefore she launched a private prosecution for blasphemous libel against Gay News and its editor Dennis Lemon. In the 1960s and 70s Mary Whitehouse was the UK's self-proclaimed guardian of Christian morality as the leader of the National Viewers and Listeners Association and leading voice in the Christian campaigning group The Festival of Light, she was on a mission to clean up British media. Last Thursday evening, we sat as a family and we saw a programme that started at 6.35. And it was the dirtiest programme that I have seen for a very long time. And Mary Whitehouse had the poem in Gay News in her sights because she felt inside, you know, that this is Christ being crucified again and that we really cannot stay silent about this. Defending gay news was lawyer John Mortimer. Mrs Whitehouse and her, her ad adherents prayed in the passages of the Old Bailey and gay news was convicted. Dennis Lemon was sentenced to nine months in prison, 18 months suspended, fined £500 and gay news was fined £1,000. So by the time the gay news trial happened, uh, there was a kind of new definition which actually the judge gave. He said that the particular uh, offence of blasphemy was irreverence, scurrility, profanity, vilification or licentious abuse of the Christian religion. 
Of course, irreverence, scurrility, profanity, vilification and licentious abuse sums up Monty Python humour beautifully. The Pythons decamped to Barbados for two weeks to hone the script without interruptions or family pressures. Well, I was in Barbados and uh, having a wonderful time at Christmas in Heron Bay. And there was this notion that we'd have to get together for two weeks and write. And I'm thinking, now, well, I could go back to London or I could persuade them all to come to Barbados. And Terry and I sort of slightly reluctantly agreed, thinking, well, when we go to Barbados, we're just going to want to water ski and swim and eat and hang out. Who's going to want to write a film? I, th I think Barbados is really one of the smartest things we did, because uh, it's the first time we actually all went away at one time to one place and just locked ourselves off. And we laughed and had a wonderful time. And I think it was a good way of working, because these ideas were thrown around really fast, and things would be adjusted and shifted, new ideas would come in. And you'd play charades with Mick Jagger and, and Jerry Hall at night and Alan Price would get on the panel. We, we were famous once upon a time. <laughs> if you're in London, you know, Cleese has to go and do a voiceover. Chapman's meeting a gay man in a pub in Hampstead, you know, pale and sliding up. And everybody's got an excuse to go away. But if you were together in a house, which we've got this beautiful house, Heron Bay, and we all stayed in it, and it was like a, a collegiate experience because that means that when you stop writing, you don't stop talking or thinking about it. People had written very good stuff. I mean, things like the writing on the wall at night, you know, the Latin. I remember John and Graham coming up with that and thinking, this is terrific, this is just what we want. Romanes aeunt domus. People call Romanes, they go the house. It, it says Romans go home. No, it doesn't. <laughs> What's Latin for Roman? Come on, ah, come on. Romanus? Goes light. Anus? What many plural of Anus is? <laughs> Annie? I think it was in those last two weeks when we were all together um, that really the themes of the film came out, like, you know, sort of uh, think for yourselves, um, don't, do, don't do what you're told, you know. And some of those scenes were written at the last moment, and, I, and it felt to me that it was, uh, it was all coming together in a very good way. The Pythons flew home with a finished script, and even though there'd been a recent prosecution for blasphemy, they'd made no compromises. I don't think there was any um, moment when we thought, well, we don't want to do that because it might be blasphemous. I was always convinced there was nowhere you couldn't go or you sh shouldn't go more to the point. I think that's, there are no sacred cows, and if they are there, if they're really sacred, then let's see how much we can puncture them and see if they still float. Kitus trailers, visita mi canal. The next big task was to find funding for the film, two million pounds. It was always going to be a struggle to get backing for such a controversial film, but undeterred, they sent the script to EMI. I sat one sunny Sunday afternoon in my garden, and I've never read a funnier script in my life, before or since. It was just a joy. I told John Gilson that we would like to make the picture, and uh, that was that. We shook hands, he opened a bottle of champagne, and I was kind of taken aback in a way because, you know, negotiations with, for finance was never supposed to be that easy. With EMI on board, the team looked for a place to film and they soon settled on Tunisia. I mean, you have to remember that Tunisia and that part of Monastir was all set up for biblical epics. That's where they made, uh, I think it was Lou Grade's Jesus Christ with, 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 with Robert Powell in and all that. So they had the temples, they had the tabernacles. All these Arab extras were quite used to coming along and being Jews for, you know, sort of a day and a half. Pre-production began, costumes were made, sets began to be built. All that was left now was to decide on the casting. It was becoming clear that the biggest decision would be who was going to play Brian. Graham Chapman was the leading contender, having played King Arthur in the Grail film, but John Cleese wanted to be Brian too. I wanted to be Brian for one simple reason, which was that I'd never played a role that went all the way through the movie. And I was very interested to know what it would be like. I'm afraid the rest of us were rather against it because, well, A, I couldn't see John as Brian, quite honestly. Um, and. And B, we, we thought there were all these other parts that we wanted John to do. You know, he's so brilliant at Reg. I mean, to me, that's one of the great performances. There's Peter Sellers doing I'm All Right, Jack. And there's Reg. They, these are the both great left-wing figures of the trade union movement portrayed on screen. And what have they ever given us in return? Nobody could have done that like he did. Uh, 
and, and nobody could have done the centurion as well as he did. They were right because they said, no, no, you will be funnier and the film will be funnier if you play the centurion and Reg. And I was disappointed just because I wanted the experience. But after very, very soon I realized they were right. And also Graham, who was a tremendously good actor. I think probably potentially almost the best actor of all of us. So everybody else acts, I think, and Graham doesn't act. Really, Graham was just Graham, and and Graham carries off both Arthur and Brian with this kind of s sincerity, with this sort of seriousness that is that works on screen. That he's he's not acting; he's he's really serious, and he's he is doing this part, being Brian, you know. February 1978, and everything was now in position to start filming. All were ready to leave for Tunisia in several days. And then the boss of EMI, Bernard Delfont, read the script. I suddenly get a, a, a very, very angry uh, telex in those days from Bernard Delfont, who was chairman of the EMI entertainment section. He said, I've looked rather quickly through the script of the new Monty Python film and I'm amazed to find that it's not the zany comedy usually associated with his films, his films, but is obscene and sacrilegious and would certainly not be in the interest of EMI's image to make this sort of film. Every few words there are outrageous swear words, which is not in keeping with Monty Python's image. This is very distressing to me and is a very serious situation. I thought it's clearly ridiculous. He doesn't know anything about films. He shouldn't be making these judgments. I called him up and um, spoke to him and said, Bernie, you've got the wrong end of the stick. I can assure you, as a Catholic, um, not a, normally a qualification I use in the film industry, uh, that uh, this is not blasphemous. It really isn't. And, um, I didn't think we should worry about that. And he had obviously made up his mind that it was. And he, after a lot of spluttering, got, and I argued with him and argued with him. And eventually he lost his temper and, and he used the immortal words. I'm not going to have people saying that I'm making fun of fucking Jesus Christ. You see, the thing was that Bernard's brother, Lou Grade, had just made Jesus of Nazareth. So, you see, he suddenly got a lot of brownie points from the establishment. <laughs> I think Bernard thought he was going to go through life with horns and a tail. So they backed out, despite the fact that the contract was valid. It was a mortal blow when EMI pulled out because, um, you know, we, we had no other option at the time. We'd done all the prep, everything down there. Now the crew was getting get on planes on Saturday morning and head to Tunisia. And on Thursday, we got the call saying, you know, Bernie Delfont has finally read the script and has pulled the plug. <laughs> Oops! The whole thing <laughs> explodes. You, you're shocked initially, and then you think, well, you know, have faith in what you're doing. There has to be another way to do this. A race to find finance for the film ensued, with Eric Idle and producer John Goldstone departing for America. Eric Idle, who's always been the kind of more entrepreneurial of, of, of the group, um, said, you know, he had various contacts in America and, and I had as well. John Goldstone and I flew to New York and then L.A. trying to find people to invest in this film. And we went to Revlon. And, you know, they, they would always see us, because they were always on, like, happy to see a python, and, you know, they like python, but then nobody really wanted to touch this with a barge pole. I actually thought the thing wasn't going to happen. I remember I accepted a role uh, working with Peter Sellers in Vienna, doing a remake of Prisoner of Zenda. And then, anyway, a miracle. A miracle happened. A miracle, say, George of Harrison. Uh, Eric Idle said, well, you know, the one person that has always been a big python fan is, is George Harrison. I met George at the uh, screening here in L.A. at the Directors Guild of an early screening of The Holy Grail. And uh, he, we became bosom pals and we were very good friends by this point. George had heard about Life of Brian and wanted to help. So John Goldstone and Eric sent him a script and set up a meeting at his Hollywood home. And Eric and I went up there and George was there and it didn't take him very long to say, I'll finance this, I mean, I think it's great. I was absolutely staggered. I was really amazed because he'd been saying that all along but I'd never really taken him seriously. Basically, that's it, I suppose. I just wanted to see the film. George Harrison offered to put up all the money himself to the tune of four million dollars. What we did was um, we pawned my house and the office in London 
and uh, to get a bank loan. Y tus trailers. Visita um, mi that canal. That was a bit nerve-wracking.